enjoying it. And my question is also about our backyards, I guess, but um, from a little different perspective. I, I work in a planning agency in, in California where we're dealing with adaptation, uh, hopefully in the same way that, that you're dealing with it in the Netherlands. And we're from a state where there is fairly widespread agreement on, on global warming and climate change, that it is coming and that there is need to deal with it. And, but we're looking at adaptations that are simply not going to be accepted. And I'm wondering how the heck you got these people to agree to the adapt. I mean, we're looking at the migration of coastal wetlands inland, but there are no places for these coastal wetlands to migrate to because everything has been developed out. We're looking at further setbacks along our coastline, again, where people will have to be uprooted. And although there's widespread agreement on, on global warming in general, there's very little, if any, agreement and very little planning and talking right now about the adaptations that will be needed. And I'm wondering just what it sounds like the Netherlands was facing some of the same decisions and came to agreement and in a fairly easy manner. Well, I'm, I'm made in not an easy manner, but I think the secret is to, to link um, adaptation to things that were on the agenda already. There is a strong tendency to increase our natural areas because, you know, we are short of, of nature in the Netherlands and people like brackish nature. And this is a constant fight with the farmers, but we know that in, in the, the, most of our country farming is not anymore economically really competitive as compared to Eastern Europe. And, and uh, so uh, the government and foundations help to buy up land and that gets a, a, a more purpose for recreation and nature conservation. So it's mainly adaptation is building on, on older agendas, uh, even in coastal protection, in, in nature conservation, in uh, improving the quality of life in cities, bringing more water into the cities, more trees into the cities. So it, it, it will never succeed for its own sake, I'm afraid, but it will succeed when you make coalition with the uh, environmental NGOs who are now suddenly into uh, much more uh, ecologically sound coastal protection. So do away with concrete and asphalt and make much more uh, uh, a clay and grass type of dikes, for example. And there you find through this coalition, it works to do the, the good things. We're doing a project in the Caribbean that deals with sort of these issues, although clearly not as built up as the LA Basin. Um, but it, uh, what we've been doing is looking at, we're doing modeling of sea level rise for the region. It's actually a project to help sea turtles. Um, but since most of the world's development uh, is, is, is in the, you actually know about this project, is in, we used your data, um, is in the, uh, is on, along the coastlines, those places are also going to be vulnerable. So what we're looking at is where do the turtles nest now? What are the easy beaches that it's clear where they can move back to because there's nothing behind them already? Or are there some beaches that have already really great elevations on them? Um, and then what are the places where the, the, where the setback would be there is already development, but that development is also equally vulnerable to the beachfront? And how do you get the planning of that process to prepare that area to include space for the sea turtles as well. Because in a country like Belize, we have the advantage of they have a very large ecotourism economy. So protecting the turtles is actually not just why would you want to protect a turtle, but it's part of their plan for how they get people to come and visit. Um, so building, that, building the, corrective, the, the correction of the human system into the preparation for the protection of the biodiversity protection system or the natural resource, be it wetlands or whatever. So make it a holistic joint planning process. And it may even be that because of your interest in coastal wetlands, you sort of drive the process to get it included from the get-go. Because I think if you wait for them to start coming up with what the plan's going to be for the houses and the roads that are behind it, the response is going to build, be that they're going to build levees and berms and forget about everything else. Well, you know, we've been talking about essentially adaptation in countries that actually have the money to be able to respond. And what, do you, what, about, what about all the rest of the world where they just don't have any money? Yeah, no, that, I mean, that's a huge deal. We have another uh, project that we're working on with the governments of India and Bangladesh where we're looking at the Sundarbans, which is largely going to be underwater quite shortly. 
Um, they're expecting to lose 12 more islands in the next 12 years. And we're look at, the project originally started because WWF has a vested interest in the tiger populations in the Sunderbonds, and all these protected areas have been created to protect Royal Bengal tigers. Well, there are a lot of people who live on the adjacent islands right. as well, and they're all going to be moving in response to climate change. Um, how do we plan for both of those factors? Because the, the adverse wildlife human interaction of both of these things moving at the same time. I mean, in tigers, you have a species that's going to fight back a little bit more than others, but you have to start planning for what that is. If, in fact, you want to continue to have tiger-protected habitat, let's plan for where we think those tigers are going to go because they're going to swim to wherever it is they want to go on their own accord. But how do you also make sure that the human communities have what it is that they need as this progression occurs? Because you're displacing ultimately millions of people who are going to have to move to someplace else, and where, where's that going to be? Where is that going to be? And in the case of Bangladesh, truly, where is that going to be? Because it well, won't I, be within I, that country. I, I don't see them being displayed. They'll probably be even more creative. But the, the big problem with, with adaptation is that, that governance and planning are quite central. And, uh, and of course, in a democracy, it's not so easy to intervene from the outside from the north, even with money, doesn't work here. So, so really, the, even in the Netherlands, we, we run our whole adaptation program through what we call co-makership and stakeholder uh, participation, because the best expertise in adaptation, uh, adaptation is with the stakeholders, not in the scientific labs. Mm -hmm. So you really have to sit together, and, uh, and people usually, local communities are most creative in, in creating adaptation options, like, like wildlife conservation options. So you really have to do that, I think, from, with the local communities. And there are not big schemes, but there are many creative opportunities to survive one or two degrees. Beyond that, indeed, it becomes very difficult.